Hello, this is a video lecture for biotechnology uh, for Wednesday, January 24th, uh, where we left off in our chapter. We were talking about recombinant DNA, and we had just talked a little bit about restriction sites, but we're taking a different turn here. We're introducing recombinant DNA and talking about what first happened after uh, this is in 1975 and as you recall in 1973 that was when the first recombinant DNA experiments were successfully done on E. coli and because of these experiments the National Institutes of Health wanted to evaluate the uh, new technology and come up with the guidelines for research and so they met uh, in what was called the Asilomar meeting in 1975 and established guidelines and uh, came up with the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee and the uh, Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee then published a set of guidelines in 1976 for working with recombinant organisms. Um, so that started the ball rolling. Um, and just to talk about transformation of bacterial cells, it turns out it's a very inefficient process. Um, but because you can select a small number of bacterial cells and they can grow very quickly, then you don't really need a highly efficient process uh, as long as you can uh, transform a few cells when you do actually do the transformation process. So. Uh, typically what you do is you take bacterial cells and you treat them with calcium chloride. Calcium chloride helps make the cells competent uh, so they can accept foreign DNA. Um, you add the plasma DNA to the cells while the cells are chilling on ice. Uh, you heat the cells very briefly and very mildly. You only need to heat the cells to about 42 degrees Celsius for about a minute. And during that heating process, the plasma DNA enters the bacterial cells. And then after that, you cool the cells again. Uh, and then as the cells start to grow, the bacterial DNA, plasma DNA, after it's entered the cells, uh, starts to replicate. The plasmids replicate and the cells replicate and the cells start to express the genes. A different type of process is called electroporation. Rather than using calcium chloride to create pores in the cell wall, you actually add a brief pulse of high voltage electricity. Uh, that creates tiny holes in the bacterial cell wall, and that allows DNA to enter. After the bacteria is transformed, again, only a very small amount of the original culture will be transformants, will have ac accepted plasma DNA. So it's important to select the recombinant bacteria after transformation. And we just define selection as a process um, designed to facilitate identification of recombinant bacteria, and it prevents the growth of non-transformed bacteria. Um, the typical type of selection is antibiotic selection. And what you do is you take cells that are transformed and you plate them on different antibiotics to identify recombinant bacteria and prevent the growth of non-transformed bacteria. Now, uh, this will select only if you have a gene on your plasmid for antibiotic resistance. For example, when we transform E. coli, E. coli is not normally tetracycline resistant. But on the plasmid that we do the transformation for E. coli, we put a tetracycline resistance gene. Then we grow it up on media that contains tetracycline, and that those bacteria that are not transformed will not grow, but those bacteria that are transformed will grow because they're now tetracycline resistant. This also does not select for plasmids that don't contain the DNA. Um, and or any type of recirculized, recirculized plasmid that didn't accept the DNA. There's also another type of selection called blue-white selection. And this is um, using the LAC-Z gene. Uh, when the LAC-Z gene is uh, 
uh, used in a vector um, and DNA is not cloned into LACZ, then LACZ produces beta-gal. Uh, beta-gal produces a blue product called x -gluc, and the colonies appear blue. However, if we clone the DNA into a restriction site and disrupt the LACZ gene, the LACZ gene is not functional, uh, beta-gal will not be produced, and then x gluc which is blue, will subsequently not be produced, and the colony will be white. Okay, so like I said, when the LACZ gene is interrupted by the inserted gene, which would be a successful insertion, the LACZ gene cannot produce functional beta-gal. X-gal, or um, not x gluc I'm sorry, X-gal, uh, is added to the colony. Um, and if functional LACZ is present, present, that's a blue colony. If non-functional LACZ is present, meaning that you successfully transform the cells, you get a white colony. And so you take the white colonies, you know that those are transformed, and you pick those colonies, and that re represents your transformed cell line. Okay, so it looks something like this. This is a pretty busy slide, and I do um, apologize for that. You have your plasmids. And you take your plasmids, and I'm looking around for my arrow because I'm going to try to use my arrow to highlight on this. It's not working. But you take your plasmid, you put the LACZ gene in the plasmid, and in the middle of the LACZ gene, you put a multiple cloning site. You take your DNA of interest out of the cell containing the gene of interest, you isolate that DNA, and then ligate it into the plasmid. Uh, using sticky ends, and then the uh, LACZ gene has been disrupted. You can see the black foreign gene has disrupted the blue LACZ gene, and you add DNA ligase to bond that covalently, and then you have a covalently bonded plasmid. You transform E. coli, and then you plate it out in a Petri dish, and those cells that are growing white, uh, the white colonies, uh, then you pick the white colonies, and those are the ones that have been successfully transformed. So to clone human genes, um, it, you use basically the same technology, only instead of using a gene of uh, other origin, you're getting a gene directly from the human genome. And of course, the first human protein expressed via recombinant techniques was insulin. The next was human growth hormone. And it turns out that insulin DNA um, actually uh, codes for two different subunits of insulin. And you have to put them into a plasmid. And then the bacterial cells are grown uh, to synthesize the protein product of the, pro of the clone gene. Uh, you can generate lots of pure protein with this technique. And of course, uh, the source of human growth hormone prior to this recombinant uh, technology was human cadavers um, and uh, human uh, pituitary tissue. And also other animals were used, uh, pig growth hormone was used for a while. Now, to make a good vector, you need to have a small plasmid. Um, it needs to be uh, small enough to separate from the chromosomal DNA. The plasmid needs an origin of replication, uh, so the plasmid will be able to replicate independently in its host cell and independent from the host chromosome. And you want to pick a origin or a plasmid that has a high copy number, meaning that the plasmids number of plasmids in the cell uh, will be much higher than um, the just the individual chromosome in the cell. You want to have a multiple cloning site that has uh, the possibility of using multiple independent restriction enzymes. 
and you can digest those restriction uh, uh, sites with restriction enzymes. And you have then multiple restriction sites that you can also digest the gene of interest with and then ligate it into the plasmid. You need a selectable marker gene. Uh, this will allow uh, selection for transformed colonies. This would be like LAC-Z if you're doing blue-white selection, or it would also be an antibiotic resistance gene if you're going that route. Uh, you want primers available, uh, usually in the multiple cloning site, um, in order to sequence through the gene of interest to make sure that the gene of interest was actually inserted into the plasmid. And here are different vector sizes. Now, most routinely used is the very top, the bacterial plasmid. And the plasmid can ex accept inserted genes upwards to 12 kb. Um, with plasmids, usually you're inserting a single gene or maybe just a group of two or three genes. And this is typically used for uh, protein expression. Uh, sometimes you're doing subcloning to prepare for protein expression, uh, but you're really restricted. You cannot insert large pieces of DNA. The next type of vector is a bacteriophage. Uh, this is a um, vector, uh, usually the phage DNA that is um, uh, from a phage that's associated with infecting bacteria. Maximum insert is 25 kb, so you can go a little bit larger. Um, however, again, this is small, and if you use phage-based transformation, this can be a little tricky as well. The next size would be a cosmid. Um, a cosmid is like a plasmid, only larger, and the maximum insert size is 35 kb. Uh, this is good for cDNA and genomic libraries. So you can clone large fra uh, fragments, but you can't clone things like whole chromosomes. Uh, and it's not good for protein expression. Again, you're getting into a large enough size that with a cosmid, you're not going to do protein expression. Um, you would rather use a plasmid for that. Also, cosmids cannot be re replicated in bacteria or in mammalian cells. Uh, next would be a bacterial artificial chromosome. And this is the size of a regular prokaryotic chromosome, so you can actually insert a large portion of DNA. This is for genomic libraries, uh, where you have large portions of uh, different prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes that you're putting into the artificial chromosome. And um, this, an artificial chromosome has a copy number of one per bacterial cell. So you don't get a high copy number, but it is a good way to store a large quantities of DNA for later manipulation. And then even larger than that is a yeast artificial chromosome, uh, which is a circular chromosome, even though it's carried by yeast, which has linear chromosomes. Uh, it can go up to two megabase pairs. And this is good for uh, cloning large DNA fragments or large genomic libraries. And you have to grow this in yeast uh, because it is a eukaryotic chromosome and it wouldn't be accepted by bacteria. And then finally, a tie vector, which is the size of a plasmid. This is just a specialized plasmid that's used for gene transfer and plants. And the maximum insert size is really around 6 to 12 kb. Um, it's similar. And we'll talk about tie plasmids when we talk about tr plant transformation. So with bacterial plasmid vectors, they're great to use. But when you use a bacterial host, you have to bear in mind that bacterial hosts cannot do post-translational modifications. And they're not going to express eukaryotic proteins properly. Uh, you can express some eukaryotic proteins like insulin, but they will require a lot of post-processing um, in your bioprocess. Insulin actually has to be chemically folded after it's produced in bacterial cells. And so this can be quite an onerous process and add expense to your bioprocess. The next size up is the bacteriophage vectors, which can hold inserts up to uh, 25 kb.
Cosmid vectors for 35 kb. Uh, and then expression vectors, uh, these are like plasmid vectors, but they're used for protein expression. And there are specialized protein expression vectors that can go into bacteria, expression vectors that can go into yeast and higher eukaryotes. And uh, typically, they're smaller size vectors, they're more plasmid based. Uh, some will achieve genomic in, or chromosomal insertion, uh, which can be helpful, especially the Thai plasmid. And, but they're used primarily for protein expression and not just for cloning. And then bar bacterial artificial chromosomes like the previous slide. And then yeast artificial chromosomes, which can accept inserts up to uh, um, two uh, megabase pairs. And then, like I said before, tie vectors. Okay. Um, bacteriophage inject, uh, vectors um, use what's called the lambda genome. The lambda genome is the genome for uh, what are called lambda phage. And you can clone up to 25 KB. The genome is actually linear, and uh, the entire genome is about 49 KB. And uh, you basically engineer the bacteriophage vector, so you've got restriction sites uh, at the center of the lambda chromosome. And then you package the recombinant chromosomes into viral particles in vitro. And then you grow up lawn of, lawns of E. coli, just uh, petri dishes that are full of confluent E. coli growth and you then plate the phage directly over top of the E. coli. The phage are just in a solution and you just wash the entire lawn of E. coli with the phage. And at the end of each lambda phage are uh, 12 base pair sites called cos sites. And these will circularize the uh, chromosome, uh, um, the bacteriophage chromosome, when they infect bacteria. And then the cost will replicate, uh, making more phage. And those phage will then go to infect other E. coli cells. And uh, you, you can use this for cloning. You can also use this for protein expression. And then once you've done this, you will obtain plaques. These are zones of dead bacteria, and they'll contain uh, millions of recombinant phage particles, and you can use this to amplify and clone large quantities of the gene of interest just by putting the gene of interest in the lambda genome. Okay, in here, uh, these are plaques that we did in our, um, in our own lab. This is using what was called T2 phage, which is a little bit different than lambda phage. But you'll see that um, this is a confluent lawn of E. coli. Oop, it left. Okay, this is a confluent lawn of E. coli. And you'll see some zones of clearing. They're not quite circular, um, but the zones of clearing are where the phage have started to eat the bacteria. And if we were to just take a small pipette and um, suck up the liquid in those zones of clearing, then we would see that they were teeming with phage and we would be able to purify out the phage DNA. Okay, the next size up is a cosmid vector. It also has cos ends of lambda DNA. It has a plasmid origin of replication, and the cosmid vector is essentially lambda DNA without the virus particle itself. Um, you'll put a gene for antibiotic resistance, so this will grow on antibiotic-containing media in, in bacterial cells. And then your DNA of interest is cloned into restriction sites. And then the cosmin can be packaged into viral particles and used to infect E. coli cells at low copy number. The colonies are grown on the plate after they're infected. And then the plate uh, contains antibiotic media. Uh, so you can uh, do antibiotic selection. So only the bacteria containing the cosmid will, be, uh, will grow. And this will allow you to clone large fragments upwards to 40 KB. OK. Uh, now, for expression vectors, um, 
they're a little bit different than cloning vectors because they are designed for protein expression and um, not just cloning. So in order to achieve protein expression, you have to have a prokaryotic pro promoter that's upstream to the multiple cloning site. The multiple cloning site is where you're going to put the coding region for the gene of interest. And then downstream, you'll need a terminator. Now, once you have this, then bacterial RNA polymerase can bind to the prokaryotic promoter and then transcribe the insert sequence, which is then translated into protein. Uh, the protein is then purified using biochemical techniques. Uh, the gene of interest has to be uh, intronless. If it comes from a eukaryotic host, remember eukaryotic gene structure does have introns, so the introns have to be taken out before you transform uh, the gene into the prokaryotic expression vector. Okay. Um, and sometimes bacterial ribosomes cannot translate eukaryotic sequences, uh, spe specifically if, if uh, the sequence contains um, uh, introns uh, because they are not spliced out in prokaryotic cells. Um, and so it's not possible to use a system with eukaryotic genomic DNA. And also the protein uh, may not be folded correctly since bacteria does not have organelles for processing. So if the bacteria, if the uh, protein requires the endoplasmic reticulum for folding or for glycosylation or for other types of post-translational modification, then bacterial cells are not the appropriate expression vector for it or you may be able to express just the linear protein and then fold it chemically like uh, what is done with insulin. Okay. Then we have bacterial artificial chromosomes. Uh, these are large low copy rings of DNA. Usually the copy number is one per cell. Uh, they contain a fertility factor and this is a uh, unit of genes, uh, coordinated genes that control bacterial replication and they can accept upwards to 300 KB. And these were crucial during the Human Genome Project because there, were, there was such a large amount of DNA that needed to be sequenced um, but grown quickly. So bacteria, which grows very quickly uh, with artificial chromosomes, was able to harbor this DNA. And then finally, yeast artificial chromosomes. Um, this is a miniature version of a eukaryotic chromosome. It has two telomeres, a selectable marker, and a centromere. In the earlier slide where I said this was circular, that is not correct. So please go back. Eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, and you wouldn't have tel telomeres on a circular strand of, uh, of DNA. So please know that the yeast artificial chromosome is linear. Um, this allows replication of uh, yeast artificial chromosome and segregation of the artificial chromosome, it goes into daughter cells uh, via mitosis. And this can take inserts, DNA inserts up to two megabase pairs. This was also used for the Human Genome Project. Okay, and then finally we have the tie vector, which is used for plant transformation. And these are naturally occurring plasmids. Um, normally, the tie vector is, uh, causes a tumor production called a gall, so it's pathogenic to plants. So tie stands for tumor-inducing vector, uh, but the, the tumor-inducing characteristics have artificially been taken out of the tie plasmid, so we can use it as an expression vehicle rather than something that's going to make a plant sick, okay? And the way this works is when bacteria infects the plant cells, it's um, a natural plant uh, infecting bacterium called agrobacterium. Uh, the tDNA, or what's called the transfer DNA from the tie plasmid, inserts directly into the host plant's chromosome. The tDNA normally in nature codes for auxin hormones that weaken the plant cell wall and starts to grow a tumor, which is called a gall. Okay. However, scientists have removed these toxic, toxic genes, and instead, in the tDNA region, they'll just put the foreign gene of interest. Okay. 
um, besides protein expression, another thing that can be done with these uh, vectors is to create DNA libraries. And libraries are just collections of clone DNA fragments. Um, if you want to uh, say you've discovered a new type of bacterium or um, a new type of organism and you want to just create a library of the DNA that you found, you can clone the DNA directly into E. coli or another type of host. Uh, and then you can use this library to screen out different genes of interest. Okay, and there are two different libraries. There's genomic DNA libraries, and then there's complementary DNA libraries. Okay, in genomic libraries, you take the entire chromosome or the entire set of chromosomes, uh, extract uh, the chromosomal DNA from the tissue of interest, and simply digest the chromosomal DNA with restriction enzymes. And this will produce many fragments uh, that include the entire genome. So you'll have uh, coding regions, non-coding regions, upstream regions, downstream regions, and intergenic regions. Um, you'll take the vector and you'll digest it with the same restriction enzyme. And then you take the entire soup uh, with the vector and all the genomic fragments and you add DNA ligase and that will ligate the genomic DNA fragments um, to into the vector. And then recombinant vectors, um, each vector will have some type of selection like blue light, white selection to make sure that the transformant or that the uh, part of the library was inserted. And then theoretically, each bacterium will contain one recombinant plasmid, okay? So each bacterium will contain a single piece of the genomic library. Um, some of the disadvantages of genomic libraries, you will clone introns in addition to exons. And because the majority of genomic DNA is intergenic uh, in eukaryotes, uh, the majority will contain non-coding pieces of DNA. And that's really fine because we're finding uses for non-coding DNA. We're understanding non-coding DNA. So having that as a part of a genomic library is important. Okay. Also, many organisms have very large genomes. So searching for a gene of interest can be very, very difficult. You have to plate out lots and lots of bacteria and then search for a clone of interest. Uh, so it may take many, many uh, screenings over many, many Petri dishes, okay? And it can be very time consuming. With cDNA, you're only looking at complementary DNA, okay? And so instead of isolating the entire genome, you isolate only the messenger RNA from the tissue of interest. Then, you need to make double-stranded DNA from RNA. And so what you have to do is first reverse transcribe the messenger RNA into single-stranded complementary DNA, okay? And you use the enzyme reverse transcriptase shown in bold here. And what that does is catalyze the synthesis of complementary single-stranded DNA from messenger RNA. Um, and after cDNA is uh, formed, the mRNA is degraded using alkaline solution or an enzyme. And then you add DNA polymerase that will take the single-stranded complementary DNA. It will synthesize a second strand, so you'll have double-stranded complementary DNA. And now you have a library that just has coding region. It doesn't have any introns. It doesn't have any energetic regions. It doesn't have any promoters or terminators. It just is code. Okay. And then to your cDNA, you add short linkers. You can usually do this via PCR. Um, and these short linkers contain uh, restriction sites. Um, so just uh, something that restriction enzymes can recognize. Then you cut these with restriction enzymes. You trim them back so you've got sticky ends. You cut your vector with the same restriction enzyme and then ligate the fragments into the vectors to create recombinant vectors.
okay? Then you transform the bacteria with the recombinant vectors, and presumably each bacterium will contain a unique vector and will contain a unique portion of the cDNA library. Okay. And this is advantageous because you're taking actively expressed genes from cells or tissues from which the mRNA is isolated. So you can look at the cells and tissues, and this will give you a snapshot of only the genes that are being actively transcribed at that time or under that condition. Introns will not be cloned, and in that way, then you can express the actual protein uh, from these cDNA libraries using bacterial cells, okay? And um, this will allow to isolate genes expressed only under certain conditions. So if you were looking at a certain disease state or you were looking at a certain physiological condition or a certain cell type, then that would give you only the genes that are being actively transcribed for that cell type, that condition, or that disease state. So let's assume that a gene involved in increased muscle mass is expressed when the muscle cells are exposed to growth hormone. So what we would do is we would take a CDN, make a cDNA library from muscle cells that were exposed to growth hormone, and we would ex extract the DNA from that library. As a control library, we might take muscle cells that were not exposed to growth hormone, and that would give us just a baseline of what genes are normally expressed when the muscle is not exposed exposed to growth hormone. And then we would look at unique clones that are only in our experimental group uh, that are not in both groups. Okay. Now, um, the disadvantage is it's difficult to extract and isolate messenger RNA. Okay. And it may be difficult to make um, a cDNA library from different types of source tissue uh, some cells are more difficult to grow or get abundance amount, abundant amount of tissue, so you may not get a very significant yield of messenger RNA. So that can be a little bit tricky at times. Okay. And so here's a genomic library being created uh, for Part A. We start out with human DNA. Um, we take and we have millions of genomic fragments. Okay, we take the fragments, we insert it into plasmids via DNA ligase, and then we transform the uh, bacteria to contain the plasmids. Over here, we have our cDNA library. So we prime the messenger RNA with the primer that's annealed to the poly A tail. Okay, and then we use reverse transcriptase that zips out the cDNA. Okay, and down here then we have complete cDNA. The mRNA is digested away, so then we have single-stranded DNA. We add DNA polymerase, uh, which is like a tiny, you know, like just a single round of a PCR reaction. Um, that creates the double strand, and then via PCR we add a linker. Here we're adding the EcoR1 site. Okay, uh, then we add the linker here. Then we digest uh, this entire fragment with EcoR1. We take the fragments, we put them into plasmids, and then the plasmids are introduced into bacteria. So the difference here is uh, on uh, part A, we have a genomic library. Part B, you have a cDNA library. You can see that it's more difficult to create a cDNA library. It's a multi-step process. It's more steps. In a genomic library, and plus you have to purify out the messenger RNA, which can be quite tricky at the beginning of making a cDNA library. Okay, now once you have a library, then uh, the trick at this point is to be able to screen out exactly the genes that you want to proceed with. You may uh, be looking for a specific function of gene, or you may be looking for a specific gene sequence. So you actually are going to identify the colony that contains the gene of interest by using a nucleic acid probe and hybridizing uh, that probe with the colony. 
okay? So you take bacterial colonies, you spread out your original sample um, on a uh, petri dish containing auger, and you grow up the colonies containing recombinant DNA. Each colony will be a clone of the single bacterium that was placed there. And so you can, you can safely say that the bacterial colony, um, each individual bacterial colony is only going to express one type of plasmid or one insert from the genome or from the cDNA library. Okay, then you take the colonies after they've grown and over top of the colonies you blot them with a nylon or a nitrocellulose filter and some of the bacterial colonies will stick to the filter at the exact lo location where they were on the plate so you're just making a print of the plate using this filter um, you'll treat the filter with an alkaline solution this will lyse the cells and it will denature the dna and uh, by denaturing the DNA, you expose single-stranded DNA. Now it's available to hybridize. The denatured DNA then binds a filter, like I said, a single-stranded DNA. And then the filter itself is incubated with a probe, which is tagged with some type of radioactive nucleotide or fluorescent dye. And the probe is a nucleotide probe. It contains a small number of nucleotides, maybe 20 to 30, that is specific for the gene sequence that you're looking for. And then that probe will attach to the complementary DNA that you're looking for. It will only attach to a single colony or maybe a small number of colonies where that particular gene is found. Okay. Once the probe binds, um, that means that you have hybridization and you take those colonies where the probe binds, the, the colonies will light up either radioactivity or through fluorescence labor, labeling. And you can then go back and pick the colonies uh, and then identify the gene that you're interested in. Okay. The filter is then washed to remove excess unbound probe. You can expose it to film for auto radiography. Uh, and anywhere there's radioactivity, then light will be released. And then the film is compared to the original auger plate to identify which colonies contain the recombinant plasmid with the gene of interest. Okay, and we can break this down. It's the same thing. You've just got a nylon membrane that is uh, blotted on the colonies that are growing up in the Petri dish. Okay. Um, then you lyse the bacteria and denature the DNA. You add the probe directly to the nylon. And then hybridization occurs in these blue colonies here. So we know these colonies contain our gene of interest. Um, then we wash the nylon filter. We develop the film. We compare this to our original Petri dish, and then we pick these particular colonies because we know they have the gene of interest, and then we can grow them up in liquid culture, and then we can isolate the recombinant plasma DNA. So in this particular instance, um, you need to know a little bit more about the gene sequence. So you need to know enough of the gene sequence that you can develop an adequate probe. Okay, so let's say we're screening a human, human library and we're looking for human growth hormone. Well, we can probably get pretty close if we know the gene sequence for a mouse or rat um, growth hormone because there's a significant amount of homology. So we'll make a probe based on mouse or rat sequence uh, for, the human for the growth hormone. And we can use this to screen the similar or the similar human library. Okay. Now, if the gene sequence has not been cloned in another species, uh, but we know something about the protein itself, say we know the protein sequence, then what can be done? Oh, okay. I didn't answer that with the next text. But what can be done is if you know the protein sequence, you can reverse engineer based on the protein sequence a number of possible probes using the codons that um, 
represent that protein. Now that becomes a little bit difficult because uh, with the genetic code, there's multiple codons that you can use. So there's a degeneracy of the genetic code. Um, so you're going to actually have to design many, many probes in order to cover the entire degeneracy of the human of, of the genetic code. And so that becomes cumbersome. If you know a protein sequence, but you don't know the gene sequence, um, it's there are other methods that can be used to actually sequence the gene. Um, once you've isolated the protein um, or isolated the genomic DNA, there are other methods that you can use. But any type of genetic information that you can use is better than trying to reverse engineer a nucleic acid probe based on the protein. Okay, now library screening rarely results in full length genes because a lot of times when you uh, hack up the genome or, or hack up the cDNA, then you're going to get fragments of genes and not full genes. So usually you'll have to sequence the uh, small pieces of the gene and then you'll have to look for overlapping sequences. And then once you get these sequences, you look for start and stop codons that will indicate the initiation and termination of your uh, coding region and then you can piece together your full length gene. So many times instead of doing a single hybridization experiment you're doing multiple hybridization experiments and you may have multiple probes for the same gene of interest. Okay now to circumvent this we can use lovely PCR. Okay and I'm sure you've studied PCR before. Uh, we are grateful to Kerry Mullis for developing this technique because it saves us from doing genomic and cDNA library screening every time we need a gene of interest. And so if we have the genome for a particular organism and we know something about the sequence, then we can amplify that sequence in a very short period of time. So we take target DNA uh, to be amplified. Uh, this would be genomic DNA, it might be cDNA, and it's mixed with nucleotides, buffer, and DNA polymerase. Usually we use TAC polymerase, which is active at high temperatures. We also add to our tube a forward and a reverse primer. Okay, these are single-stranded DNA nucleotides and they correspond with two flanking regions uh, for the gene that we're interested in. And these primers um, will flank the five prime and the three prime region of the gene. And then we put the whole mixture into a thermocycler and we run a thermocycle, okay? So the thermocycle will take the DNA through the PCR cycle first step is we start out with double-stranded DNA, so we need to denature it, so we have single-stranded DNA. We heat it to approximately 95 degrees Celsius in its reaction tube. That's sufficient to um, denature the DNA. Then we have to anneal the primers directly to the denatured DNA, so they have to uh, anneal or hybridize to the target sequence. Okay, so in annealing, we're actually allowing the DNA to renature, uh, and we do that by cooling the whole mixture down to about 60 degrees Celsius. Then with DNA polymerase, uh, we actually want to heat it to an optimum temperature, and for TAC polymerase, the optimum temperature is between 70 and 75 degrees Celsius, so that's our third part of the cycle, and that will allow DNA polymerase to make multiple copies of the gene of interest. Okay. At the end of one cycle, the amount of DNA that we're interested in, just the gene that we're um, cloning via PCR, uh, will have doubled. So we do multiple cycles. We can repeat it 20 to 30 times. And by the end, we have over a million copies of the gene of interest. Okay, and it looks something like this. Target DNA is here. And we have our probes. Uh, our primers, five prime and three prime primers. Okay, we have our nucleotides. We put that in the reaction mixture. 
we denature, and that uh, splits this into single-stranded DNA. We hybridize or anneal by cooling, and the primers then hybridize to the five prime and three prime ends of the gene. Okay, then we extend our primers um, in the extension stage, and that allows TAC polymerase to make double-stranded DNA. Okay, then we repeat the cycle. We go from two to four, and then four to eight, and so on. Okay. And here is, um, I want to go back to plaque hybridization. Uh, this is um, colony hybrid, uh, colonies that are being hybridized here. And you can see that uh, where these colonies are lit up, this is just an auto radiograph after the DNA probe has been added and washed and the film has been developed. And you can see that each one of these colonies has uh, one of the genes of interest that we're actually probing for. Now, PCR is much easier because you do not have to plate out the bacteria. You can just start with genomic DNA, so you don't have to do, you don't have to generate a genomic DNA library or a cDNA library. You can just simply get millions of copies of the gene of interest uh, from starting material from genomic DNA in a short period of time. And the number of copies is just two to the n, where n represents the number of PCR cycles, assuming that you start with one molecule of DNA that you are interested in. Okay, and if you do 22 cycles, then that's just two to the 22nd power. Now, like I said before, we use a, a specific type of DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase. This is from the species called Thermus aquaticus, and that thrives in hot springs. Um, and that allows us to um, just grow at high temperatures. And at high temperatures over and against 37 degrees Celsius, um, the uh, PCR reaction occurs much more quickly. Now, what would happen if you tried to run your PCR reaction at 37 degrees C? Well, it wouldn't work because all the DNA at 37 degrees C, C would re-anneal, so you wouldn't have single-stranded DNA. You actually have to heat it up to a temperature where the DNA is denatured. So TAC polymerase actually works at 75 degrees Celsius, and at that point you will have single-stranded DNA um, you know, it's above the annealing temperature of around 60 degrees Celsius, and so that will allow the process to continue because the majority of the DNA at that point will be single-stranded. Um, so you can do this uh, DNA uh, uh, TAC polymerase. PCR is used to make DNA probes. It's used to study gene expression um, by reverse RT-PCR. Uh, you can detect bacterial and viral infections. Uh, you can um, sequence genes to identify genetic conditions that are uh, due to mutations. You can use this for uh, detection of DNA at a crime scene. And then you can also use this for, uh, you know, more paleo forensics. So if you want to uh, look at the DNA from fossilized dinosaur tissue. Now, that's a little dicey because the half-life of DNA is about 60,000 years, and so dinosaur tissue, if the tissue is millions of years old, then the majority of the DNA would be degraded. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, cloning PCR products, it's much easier to do this than to use DNA libraries, but in order to do the cloning with PCR, you need to know something about the gene and the flanking regions in order to design the primers. Okay, so uh, let's say that the Human Genome Project wasn't completed, but you want to clone growth hormone from humans, um, then what sequence would you use to design PCR primers?
Well, this depends. If you know something, if you know a homologous growth hormone sequence, say from another mammalian species, say from chimpanzees or dogs or rats or whatever, then you could design your primers based on that homologous sequence. And that would be the best way to do it. Um, if you didn't know the homologous sequence, then you would actually use a protein sequence and you would come up with degenerate primers based on reverse engineering what the genetic sequence would be uh, for a given protein sequence. And again, that's very difficult. So if you can find a homologous, sequ homologous sequence from dogs or cats or mice or rats or whatever, then that's the best way to go if you don't have the human DNA information. Uh, it's a bit of a moot point now that we have uh, cloned the human genome. And uh, so we just uh, look at the sequence and we design our primers accordingly. So to look at um, how we do PCR, We've got our target DNA, we denature the DNA, and then we anneal the primers, and then we amplify the DNA with TAC DNA polymerase, okay? And that will give us a PCR product. And here are multiple copies of our PCR product. Um, we take that and um, usually with the primers, what you can do is you can build in restriction sites in a, that are um, at, the, at the ends of the primers, and that res those restriction sites will go ahead and be cloned uh, directly into the vector of interest, okay? And usually the easiest way is just to add an adenine nucleotide that will overhang, okay? And then you have an overhang here where an adenine is needed. So you just have a slight sticky end where the A will bind the T here. Uh, then you put the clone PCR product with the Thai plasmid. And then you add DNA ligase. And then you've got a um, uh, your PCR clone is put directly into the vector. And then you can transform your bacteria. OK. And using this, there's a number of different, you know, once you actually clone out, whether you use uh, library-based construction or use PCR, there's a ton of different things that you can do. Uh, you can express the protein um, to study protein function and structure. That You can use it to make a medical therapeutic. Uh, you can use the protein for other purposes. You can use it for human gene therapy. Um, you may just use the information to um, uh, clone animals with a knockout of that particular gene. Um, you can use it as GMOs uh, for GM plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, I think what I'll do at this point is I'll stop here. So uh, in the next video lecture, we'll start with gel electrophoresis. Uh, I'm sure you've done gel electrophoresis. Uh, I will go over it, uh, not in detail. I just want to review the process uh, so you know that and you'll be ready for the exam. Okay, so I'll conclude the video lecture. At, at this point. Alrighty. Thank you.